Hello everyone, this is Remlays from 40k Theories, and welcome to the July 2020 edition of the Patreon Q&A sessions. As always, if you would like your questions answered, then click the link in the video description below and help support the channel by becoming a patron. Now, let's jump into the questions. Voice of the Emperor asks, is there any ship in the Imperium that is above a Gloriana class battleship? Uh, the Phalanx? The Imperator Somnium? Eucephalus, potentially? Yeah, so not many, but there are. Drachnian vs the Emperor's Sword, which comes out on top. Oh easy, Drachnian, because the Emperor, with his sword, couldn't destroy Drachnian, so yeah, Drachnian's tougher. Sorry, gotta give it to that. Kari Wolfong asks, Whatever happened to the Emperor's flagship? Which one, the Bucephalus or the Imperator Somnium? Because I don't think we ever got an official answer for either of them. Well, technically we didn't anyway. Because for the first half of the Great Crusade he used the Bucephalus, the second half it was the Somnium. With the Bucephalus, it might have been destroyed and the reason for this, take it with a very large pinch of salt, is because of Alpharis's origins, or one of Alpharis's origins, which had the Emperor crash his flagship into a Sloth flagship in order to rescue Alpharius. Whether that story is true or not is another matter entirely. As for the Imperator Somnium, I think it might have been destroyed at some point prior to the Siege of Terror because I don't recall it ever being mentioned by name in Solar War, though it has been a while since I read that book so I could be wrong, but Rokodorn's plan for evacuating the Emperor should, you know, terribly overrun was to put the Emperor on the Phalanx. Now yes, the Phalanx is a very big ship, but the Imperator Somnium was... It was about the size of one of Terra's orbital defence plates. It was not exactly a small ship, it was bigger than most battleships, with a hell of a lot more firepower. So, if you're not going to put the Emperor on that and put it on the Phalanx, that would suggest to me that the Somnium has been destroyed at some point. Asbetes asks, How do the Grey Knights and Custodians perceive each other? They view each other as being honourable and noble warriors and doing the Emperor's work. The Grey Knights, I wouldn't say, adore the Custodians, but if nothing else, you know, there is a mutual respect and understanding between the two, uh, because they both work really damn hard and are both martial warriors up here. I know martial warrior is kind of a redundant term, but you get what I mean. Chief Surgeon asks, Is Kaiser Lane still alive, and if not, how did he perish? Wasn't he killed at the end of Outcast Dead? Oh god, um... Wasn't he killed by... Oh, what's her name? Fuck. Um... The Navigator. Is it Kastana? Was it Kastana? Um, a Navigator called Kastana basically opened a third eye and vaporised him with it, from what I recall. Or killed him with it rather than vaporised, but yeah, um... Oh god, um... I think that's what happened, but... If I'm wrong, please let me know in the comments section down below. Ghost Reaper asks, How is it that there haven't been any Chaos Primaris Marines by now? Plot convenience. <laughs> it's basically that simple. Plot convenience. What allows the Adeptus Sororitas to wield modified bolters, and could it be applied to the Imperial Guard? They're not modified per se, it's just a different pattern of bolter. <laughs> I've forgotten the fucking pattern name off the top of my head. Um, might be the Dominica pattern. Um, I I'm probably wrong though. But yeah, it's not exactly modified, it's just a smaller bolter. That's just, you know, smaller frame, but basically all the same components. You know, as far as I'm aware, it still fires the exact same ammunition, so yeah. As for where that can be given to guardsmen, technically you could potentially arm the guard with bolters, but let's be honest here, with the amount of soldiers in the Imperial Guard, which numbers upon the tens of billions, it's probably just cheaper and easier to give everyone the standard issue cheap and cheerful las gun. I mean, let's be honest, the main reason why the Sisters of Battle have bolters and power armour is because the Ecclesiarchy is fucking minted, and they can afford to give their, you know, chamber militant the nice fancy toys. You know, same with the Astartes. The Astartes get all the fancy toys because A, the Emperor made them, so it's kind of like, you know, you kind of have to give them preferential treatment, and B, there's not, not actually that many of them in comparison to Guardsmen. Because bear in mind with Space Marines, you know, give or take a few thousand, there's only about a million of them. You know, prior to the Ultima founding, it was 1,000 chapters of 1,000 Marines. And yes, I know some chapters were above that threshold, Black Templars, but you have to remember a lot of chapters were also vastly under strength. You know, look at the Lamenters, for example. 
so it kind of balances out in the end. So yeah, while in theory you could give the Guardsmen or bolt guns, it would be monumentally expensive and take an extremely long time to roll it all out. It's just easier, simpler, cheaper and faster to get more LAS guns. Because LAS guns are also, despite being flashlights, they're also incredibly durable weapons. Like if you want to recharge the ammo cell, you can literally chuck it into a fire. I mean, yeah, it might damage it in the long term, but if you ain't got a charging port for it, if you haven't got the solar ports working, you can chuck it into a fire and it will actually charge up the ammo for it. So it's just, yeah, it's just easier for the guard to have loud guns. Did the Tau get anything out of the Psychic Awakening storyline, such as a new unit to help them deal with Psychers? I'll be honest, I still need to read the Tau Psychic Awakening book, so I can't say for certain. Sorry. Pentadus asks, how long would it take for the Inquisition to look into reports of a xenoheretical group of humans found on the edges of space? If it's on the very edges of space, it could take them a very long time because the Inquisition might just put them on the back burner until they decide that they're a threat. So it could be a while. Austin Horner asks, and this is quite a long question, In Valdor Birth of the Imperium, two interesting points occur. Firstly, it is shown in the Gene Seed repository held in the fledgling Imperial Dungeon that much of the Gene Seed was already separated with the future iconography of the Legions, including that of the Blood Angels and Space Wolves, with the first generation of Astartes even bearing the winged sword of the Dark Angels in their first battle. This appears to contradict later accounts of the Legions taking their emblems, such as the Lion choosing the winged sword upon his reunion with the Emperor. Do you think this is simply a case of the writers forgetting such details? Um. It could be, but it could also be an example of just a hard retcon. Because bear in mind in Descent of Angels, where it shows the lion adopting the winged sword as his icon, that book is from around 4th edition, it was from 2007. So a lot of the lore has changed in that time, because much of the lore around that point was still basically just 3rd edition lore, and it has been vastly expanded upon since, so this instance I'm likely to say it is in fact a hard retcon. At the end of the book, Malkador reveals to Valdor that the Emperor believes the Primarchs are not dead and he has taken to calling them his sons, with both Valdor and Malkador seeing this paternal bond as a negative price that must be paid. What do you think of the Emperor seemingly always viewing the Primarchs as his sons? Does that make him an even worse father? This one, it's a bit harder to say if it's a true retcon or not, or if it's something else entirely because a lot of the stuff regarding the Emperor and his sons and the fact he never loved them comes from 7th edition and early 8th edition lore with Master of Mankind and with Dark Imperium. So I mean it could be possible that the Emperor is just simply lying and he just wants to keep up the illusion so when he is reunited with the Primarchs you know Malk doesn't turn around and say, hey, uh, the Emperor doesn't actually love you, you know, you know, he just views you as tools, because that might be a bad thing, you know, who would have thought, am I right? <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, at the end of the day, the Emperor is a shit dad, he was a shit dad, he's always going to be a shit dad, because the Emperor, you know, despite appearing human, is not really human anymore, if you get what I mean. Luke and Ron asks, is there anything that you wish for GW to retcon to be different, or just gone? To be honest, I'd rather GW just retcon Typhus's origins to be consistent, because even in the Horus Heresy series, it's fucking contradictory as fuck. <laughs> I just want to have a nice, clear and concise story regarding Typhus, please. Thank you very much. Why do you like the Night Lords specifically? The colour scheme, the iconography, the fact that they were pretty much the de facto Chaos Space Marine Legion back in 2nd edition when I started, and I always liked the look. Pretty much that. Are there any Inquisitors that merely use their authority and position to advance their own personal gain? More than likely. Do you think that the urge to kneel in front of the Primarchs is really a thing that's part of human instincts that is activated, or is that merely a tool for the writers to convey the Primarchs' magnificence? Yes. <laughs> uh, pretty much both, I'd say, because remember, the Primarchs are effectively warp creatures at the end of the day. I know that sounds very strange, but yeah, they are filled with warp energy. They're not truly human anymore. Well, they were never truly human to begin with. Um, so yeah, it makes sense that the Emperor would program something into the Primarchs and project an aura that makes people want to kneel before them. 
And it could just be a fact, you know, how, how massive these boys are, because let's be honest, if you look up towards, you know, a big kingly looking fucker who's like nine feet tall, you're probably going to want to pay fealty to him. Zero Hits asks, if the Orcs won and beat every single race in the galaxy once and for all, what do you think would become of them once they realised that there was no one left to crump? That's easy, they just turn on each other and beat the shit out of each other, like they do anyway. Brandon A asks, The planet of Themeris is said to have nature spirits which are actually demons, but are these demons different and actually like the planet, since they actively demand their will to be strong of body and spirit? In fairness, a lot of demons like to have a host that's strong of both body and spirit because it's just easier for them. You know, a stronger host, both physically and spiritually, is easier for a demon to bond to. Um, that being said, whether they're chaos demons is another matter entirely, but yeah, they are basically demonic entities. You know, because a demon is basically a warp spawned entity that isn't an enslaver or anything like that. Kenji22 asks, would you describe Commissar Yarek as brutal but cunning, or cunning but brutal? Cunning but brutal, I'd say, I think it fits in better. And finally, Aubrick asks, how do you feel about the new 40k logo? I think it's going to take us right into the danger zone. <laughs> in, all, in all seriousness, yeah, I know a lot of people point out how it's you know, not centred, even though the previous logo wasn't actually centred either. <laughs> but it is very noticeably misaligned with that final R. If they just moved the letters over just, you know, a couple of pixels, it'd be fine, it'd be acceptable, but it's just that R that really, really annoys people with OCD. How do you feel about Primaris Marines? I have no issue with them. The only time I ever had an issue with Primaris Marines was when they first dropped, because back then there was literally bugger all law, and it seemed very rushed. That was my issue, the fact that it was rushed. Not the fact that there was a new breed of Space Marine, the fact that all the lore for it was pretty much rushed and just shoved out the door before it was ready. You know, I mean, yeah, I know Primaris Marines were basically hinted at in the lore, you know, several years prior, you know, thanks to the Raven Guard Raptors, but even so, it was very rushed. That was my only issue with it, the fact it was rushed to fuck. But aside from that, I have no issue with them. I think they're perfectly fine. Um, I think the aggressors look kind of cool, actually, so yeah, no issue with them. Who's your favourite Autobot and favourite Decepticon? Uh, favourite Autobot, G1 Star Saber, um, the cartoon version, not the comic version, and definitely not the manga version, because that one's just goddamn creepy. And sticking with Victory, actually, favourite Decepticon, Deathsaurus, because his name is goddamn Deathsaurus. That's just an awesome name. And that concludes this edition of the Patreon Q&A sessions. As always, if you would like your questions answered, then click the link in the video description below and help support the channel by becoming a patron. Until next time, this has been Remlays on 40k Theories, and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye!